Ace. Judy. Yes. What is it you want to know? I want to know where you came from. Shit, you want me to go through my entire checkered life? Yes, please. Yo, 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 yo. You know, my publishers asked me to write a book. And I said, my whole life? <laughs> where do I begin? <laughs> where do I begin? So those of you are watching me on Facebook, I don't even want to look that way. It's Judy's idea that I should just talk the way I normally talk. Okay, so when I was like a little boy, when I got to like 12, 13, 14, this is now during the war. Sorry, where were you born? Port Elizabeth. Oh, okay. Sirens would go, airplanes are coming or whatever, would go to bomb shelters. You know that siren they make? Yeah. I don't know where the hell those things were, but I, I suppose every city's got them. I don't know how, I wonder if it works here. Let's hope we I mean, find if, out. if airplanes came to bomb, I don't know. Anyhow. <laughs> Those were the days, 1941. Na yeah, 1941. Dang, my grandfather was born in 1941. <laughs> you mean I was? <laughs> Hell yeah. no! No <laughs> ways, I'm not born in 1941, but I am. <laughs> my birth certificate is. <laughs> but not me, hey, no ways. So, I grew up in Port Elizabeth. When I got like 12, 13, 14, I used to go down to the local fish and chip store. It was like a cafe, you know, uh, snacks, bologna, slice, we had a machine to slice bologna and, and cigarettes and ice cream and <coughs> a pinball machine. They always used to come play pinball there. So the owner, George, a Portuguese man, said to me one day, you want to come help me in the afternoon? I said, after school, yeah. How much will you pay me? And, and he told me, I think it was 25 cents for the day. And 25 cents was a, a crown. We called it a crown. That's two shillings and a half, two and a half shillings those days, pounds, shillings and pence. And I suddenly disappeared off Facebook. I don't know why, but no, I'm back again. <laughs> um, I was just checking Well, don't mess around with shit. I was checking something. Okay. So, uh, so I started working in there. My mom, four children. My dad's in airplanes. He was, um, he would like map out the bombing areas. They'd fly over and they'd give all those plans of the landscape and all that. He was doing that. And we had to survive and my mother working in a factory. She was a supervisor, but it was, I think it was clothing. Mm -hmm. Really nice factory because every Christmas they got the entire staff and their children and they gave us all presents. Oh, nice. A pretty cool company. And so I was like contributing, you know, getting money every every day every day from George. So I worked there two, three years. The circus used to park when the circus came once a year, like three weeks. So they would park in the, uh, behind the law courts in Portland, a big open field. And I used to go over there. I got friendly with some of the artists and the one artist, he taught me how to do rope spinning spinning ropes and then jumping inside and all that, and I practiced, and I practiced. <laughs> the juggler, the guy who did the juggling, I used to like visit his, um, his caravan, because everybody stayed in caravans in the circus or in the train, the circus train. You had your compartment there, which you shared with maybe four other guys. <laughs> <laughs> he taught me how to juggle, so I learned how to juggle, then the trapeze artist over the years, taught me how to fly trapeze and tightrope walking. See, you kind of learn from each other. You practice and, and so I became a good performer. Mm -hmm. So then when I was finished school, did I finish? Hell no. <laughs> I failed standard three. Uh, my mom put me in a new school. 
They put me in standard four. After a while, they said, hell no. They put me back to standard three. <laughs> and so I got through three. I got through four, which was the difficult year. In five, six, you got to high school. Mm -hmm. I did six. I passed. Well, they put me to seven. I failed. Uh -huh. But my mom asked the principal, please, you now yeah, I got like 40%, you need 42 or whatever it was. Put him up, so they put me up to eight. I failed. Uh -huh. So I got a standard six certificate. Then to have I'm a doctor. Nice. You get this, what they call the old age, old age uh, exemption to do a degree. Mm -hmm. So I got an old age exemption because I was smart. I'm a true boy. We know how to make money, we know how to do business, we, you know. So I went, practiced for the circus, I practiced at home, step ladders, doing somersaults and all that sort of stuff at home in my garden. I was a, a bugler in the, in the school band and I practiced bugle and trumpet and I got pretty good. Mm. And then um, when I got 18, I was too old to continue school. Everybody was already out of school and I'm only, I'm going to go back to seven. I'm going to go back to eight and try and do the second year. I'd be like 20 years old before I get out of school. So uh, we all said, hey, no. So I, I split from Port Elizabeth to Joburg. He tried. He tried with a little school suitcase. Uh, I had very little clothes those days anyhow. School uniform with the socks and the short brookies, you know, and the jacket that's got the braiding on it mm -hmm. and the collar and tie. I hitchhiked from Port Elizabeth to Joburg. It was super nice. Enjoyed it all the way. I remember one ride I got. I think I was dropped off in just before Queenstown or Alloway North or somewhere. And um, I had no money. I had two pounds. 15 shillings. It was quite a bit of money those days, two pound 15 shillings. I think it was about a month's salary or something, you know. Uh, and, um, but I, I would need that. And so, uh, the guy said, where are you going to stay? I said, mm, I don't know. Um, he said, well, look, uh, I can take you to, um, What's it called? Uh, for men only. It's uh, what is that society called for men? Like a camp or something? No, man. It's um, um, that in every city around the world, they got the women's one and the men's one. It's some organisation. Mm -hmm. So he took me there. So I get to this place, and there's some guy in the in the front desk area and this guy says to him, uh, we're looking for a place for the man to stay for the night. So he said, oh, you can come stay with me. Takes me to his room. He wasn't a faggot, but I, I was aware of what faggots were. There's no way I'm going to stay there. Takes me to his room. It's like they've been playing cards or something because there's matchsticks on the table and cards and money. Lots of like pennies and tickies and sixpences and on his table. And he said, he's going out. He leaves me there. The man, is, the man is trusting, very nice. And now I'm here at eight o'clock in the night or seven, seven o'clock, eight o'clock at night in this man's room and he's gone out. A dude probably in his 20s or yeah, somewhere around the late 20s or something, as I remember. I was like 18. I was going to join the circus, which was up in, uh, was in Boxburg, where the circus was. So I went to go and join the circus. And um, I didn't know, I didn't want to go to sleep because I was scared like, you know, is this guy going to kill me tonight or what he's going to do? I don't know. So I spent the night. There was nothing there to keep me awake. There was a Bible. I read that whole, the whole Bible. 
almost through and through. I won't tell you, I heard it till about 2, 3 in the morning when he came home. And he said, you're still awake? I said, yep. And anyhow, we went off to sleep the next day. He gave me a ride to the main road that, that leads out of this town. I think it was in Queenstown. And it was to Alloa North and then on to Bloemfontein and whatever. And then Joey's, Johannesburg. Eventually got to Johannesburg. Uh, I got a man in a Volvo. It was like the very first Volvos that came out. It was one of those like round ones. Oh, yeah. The kind of round hatchback, old, you know, but man, that thing would do a hundred miles an hour. It was like smooth as, I thought, man, this is a good car, Volvo. No, of course, today it still is. Stayed in Joburg, went to Boxburg, um, where my mother had moved to with my sister, and she was in uh, working for Koo, K O O, you know, the canned foods and all that. Yeah. She became a supervisor there. So he's working there and I stayed with her. I think we slept in the same room. I think it was only one room, I can't remember. And, uh, and I went to the circus and I stayed there and I learned to do more things. Then we went on tour. And so for a year or two, I was a circus artist. Thousands of people, all the different venues we went to and uh, performed there. I got pretty good. I was a successful performer and I could also sing. So they always heard me singing outside the tent when there was no people there, you know, no audiences, while we still getting preparation in the mornings, and I'd be singing. So then the, the band, that they, they always have a band in a circus, said, I want you to sing, opening number, you know. And I said, really, me? And I sang. Then I left the circus and became a singer. So I joined a band called Group 66. I remember our first uh, album that we made was In the jungle, the mighty jungle, the lion sleeps tonight. And of course, I would do the high parts. We I can't do it now. Shit. And then I would do that. And that was a our, our, our big hit at the time. And later on, we went to do um, another one, which is a hit I can't remember right now. Anyhow, then uh, with that, a modeling agency approached me and asked me if I'd like to do modeling. So I said, yes. I didn't know what, the, what modeling was all about, but I had to wear a suit with a girl on my arm and walk the ramp. Walk up, you know, you walk up the ramp doing modeling shows. So I did that and I sang and I did that. So I was pretty much a showman all the time. Then in um, gee, 19, then I became in my 20, 2021. 20, I met a girl, I married her. Uh, uh, she comes from a famous family, but I won't mention names. Uh, similar to what? Still good. I was uh, hoping you'd ask another question or two. <laughs> uh, well, tell me more about the famous people that you've met. Oh, to get down to that. Okay, so, yeah. all right, but are you going to, you going to the bathroom? You're going to be right back? Yes, I'm going to be right back. Oh, okay. Thanks. Now, well, while I'm waiting for her, I'll speak to you guys. Uh, yeah, it's winter, bro. It's winter. It's pretty cold in the house and I don't believe in in air conditioning, heaters and all that crap, so keep warm. Anyhow, so uh, I opened up, a, I went to Celtic's petrol station and I said I would like to open up a petrol station because we, my wife and I, well, my fiancé and I, 2021, we hadn't got married yet, uh, we bought a car a brand new Fiat 1500, uh, 1,300 Rand, brand new, 1,300 Rand for a brand new Fiat 1500, uh, those days. Today it's uh, not 1,300, it's 130,000 
today. Uh, the rand, those days, one rand bought one dollar fourteen cents. Today, one rand buys maybe six or seven cents. <laughs> oh, great, great government, great, great uh, finance uh, finance ministers, and even though the current finance minister, I know very well, Enoch. Um, however. Uh, they they agreed. I drew a plan how I would like the garage to look. I want a workshop. I want the offices. I want a showroom to put sell Fiat motor cars, because when I got the Fiat, I opened a motor car club called a one make motor car club, Fiat, Fiat 1500. Hundreds of people joined. Hundreds, of, and we, we became the biggest one-make motor car club in South Africa. Alfa Romeo was second. They also had a motor car club. Then there was the old car motor car clubs. And so I told Celtics, I have a lot of people. I'm the chairman and the founder of the Fiat Club. I have hundreds of Fiats that will patronize me from the day I open. I've got a Fiat mechanic specializing who worked for Fiat and they built the whole building for me. It's in Marshall Street in Johannesburg. Basil Green Motors, I was now Basil Smith Motors. I kept my name to Smith, not Goldsmith. Not Jewish, just plain Smith. Basil Smith Motors. And I became uh, a Fiat, I started racing the car. Opened up the garage, up the road was Basil Green. He was racing Chevs, Chev Ramses, uh, V8s, or V6s, I can't remember, but fast. And Basil Van Royen, and three Basils. He was racing Mustang. He had his garage on the outside of the city. So I ran the petrol station, workshop, uh, lubrication bays, mechanics I had. Uh, 12 employees. I was only 23. After two, three years of running the business, I became the first self-made millionaire in South Africa. I was successful in my business. I did great business. And I had a lot of followers. I think God had a plan for me. I would always have followers to this day. And trust me, it's not me, it's God. God worked in my life. Even those days when I was still a sinner. You know, and I was a philanderer. And then I, I got married. Didn't really cheat on my wife. I, I think one time a woman came into the petrol station. My wife wasn't there. She was an oriental, it was exciting. And I probably gave her a bang bang upstairs in the offices upstairs. Who knows? But I was not what you would call a God-serving man or a God-fearing man. He does not like the adulterers at all. And um, then after about, uh, there was 1972, I sold the garage to my wife, who I now divorced, and her brother-in-law, and they took out of the business. And I said, okay, I'm going to America. I'm a singer. I had a great voice, especially when I sang My Way by, by Frank Sinatra. I would see people in the audience, tears running down their eyes. I still sing it pretty good, but I'm not going to do it on this show, uh, on this podcast or whatever you call this, what I'm doing now. And um, I saw the guys, I got to Las Vegas. At first I went to Chicago because the year before I'd gone on holiday to Israel. And there I met a guy from Chicago, a, another Jewish boy. So he invited me to Chicago, so I went to Chicago, I stayed there two months. I got mononucleosis. Mononucleosis was the kissing disease. I'd been in England the, uh, the night before, in London, Old Year's Eve. Trafalgar Square, if you know that at all. Old Year's Eve, like thousands of people turn up around the fountain. Happy New Year and all that, and everybody's kissing everybody. 
every chick. It didn't matter if he was with their husband or whoever. Every men were just kissing and, and women were just kissing, just kissing, kissing, kissing. I must have kissed a hundred chicks that night. I got in Chicago and I got mononucleosis. That is the esophagus, esophagus the um, uh, larynx, and and it's difficult to breathe and it's difficult to swallow and eat. So I ended up in the hospital for a few days. I don't know how I got out of it, but I did. God made me do that. Um, and um, I left Chicago and I got a, a newspaper advert looking for co-driver um, across America to explore. Co-driver. It was a German dude. Yeah, I applied. I called him up. I said, dude, he said, I've already got two other passengers and it's a four-seater car. I said, you want me, dude? You want me? I'm a professional race car driver. Oh, when I had the petrol station, the Celtic station, I raced my motor car. So, uh, um, uh, Fiat South Africa, Dr. Bucher, he sponsored me. I said, I want a car, I want to hot it up, a Fiat, and show the durability of it, and, and they agreed, so they gave me a car. Because I was also selling Fiat in my, in my showroom, I was selling Fiats. And um, I raced, and my car eventually, the car 45, Fiat, won the South African Championship for that class. You got different classes. Obviously, you don't race against the Mustang. That's, a, that's against the V8s and the Chevrolets and you race in a different class. Finished my racing career, successful. Won championship with the car. Finished my career as a, a business owner. <laughs> Oops, excuse me, at 23 years old. Sold by the time I was 27, 28. Eight. And now I'm going off to America to become famous as a singer. Well, the fame and the fortune, eh, it might have been there, it might not have been there, but I met a man. He was the producer of Elvis Presley at the Hilton Hotel. He was the producer of Frank Sinatra, Barbara Streisand, Elvis Presley. He was the musical director. So he has his whole band and plays for each artist, you know, as, they, as the various artists come to perform in the casinos. Uh, one week it would be Barbara Streisand, or sometimes two, three weeks, and then Frank Sinatra, and then Elvis Presley, then Glenn Campbell, then Eric, Eric Clapton, and Shirley Bassey, and, and I've seen them all. I've seen them all, watched all their shows. Um, I met this man who was an agent. So he would book musical groups into different casinos and clubs around America. And he liked me. So he gave me a job. He said, and I sang, and he said, you got a great voice. He said, but you're not going to be a platinum. And we're not looking for gold records, we're looking for platinum. <laughs> so you're good, but you're not that good, you're not going to be a star. So just stay as an agent. Stay as an agent booking bands, which I'd done a little bit of in South Africa, you know, at the same time. So, okay. So the first thing I had to do was I had to go to the Hilton Hotel and meet the um, musical, the, the entertainment director of each casino, Caesars Palace, Hilton Hotel, um, Flamingo, and meet all the entertainment directors. At that time, I traveled back to South Africa for a couple of weeks and I bought a suitcase full of souvenirs, South African. You know, the assegai and the spear that goes through the springbuck. It's like a, a springbuck uh, skin. You know, have you seen them? And it's got the little grooves in it, and it's got the, the assegai and the, the, 
the bow, the arrow thing going through, a and they a shield, yeah, and they used to use that when the Zulu war was on or something. Mm. So I took that and African masks, and so I took that, and that was like, wow, all the way from Africa for Americans at the time, all the way from Africa. <laughs> you live in Africa? I said yes. How many of them asked me, so how do you live? I said, well, you know, with all the wild animals. I said, well, we live in trees. We build tree houses. And uh, where's your toilets? I said, oh, well, we go in the bush. But when we go in the bush, uh, my sister would have to come with, <laughs> with a, a rifle. So I could have a dump in the bush. But a lion or a leopard, um, anything wild could attack you there, so you go in the bush, there's somebody like protecting you. You can't just walk <laughs> around with, unless you've got a gun with you, you know. <laughs> it's us, and they believe me. Yeah. They, they believe that we, we did that. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they, they actually believe me. I'll never forget that story, how I bull twanged mm -hmm. a better word for another word for it but let's call it bull twanged people are we lived up in trees and had to go to the <laughs> toilet up there in the bush and, and they all bought it Africa Africa <laughs> so I gave them these gifts all the entertainment directors of all the casinos and got them good books it just so happened that Elvis Presley for his first live performance after coming back from Germany, from the, the war and all that sort of, and uh, what's going on in Germany, right? When he came back from the camps in Germany, his first live performance, Colonel Parker, who was his manager, whom I met, um, brought him to Hilton Hotel. Mm -hmm. and, and I asked David, da Mr. Davidson was his name. He was the entertainment director. I want to see Elvis. And he said, sure, son. Mm. Get, how many tickets do you want? Yeah. And we talked and talked. And he said, so you know a lot of girls? I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm popular. I was a good looking dude. South African accent. The chicks just rolled over, you know. That's, <laughs> oh, I love the way you speak, you know. <laughs> and so he gave me like eight or six, 12 or something tickets. Bring chicks. Just bring girls front row, and they got to know that if they're getting the front row seats, they're going to meet Elvis after the show in the dressing rooms. Some of them got to meet Elvis, some of them didn't. You what you did meet was the drummer or the guitarist or the pianist. Yeah. You met the band, and the band would take you home, and you know what happens then. But that's uh, the chicks were like, Elvis, Elvis, you work in Elvis's band, you know, like you're your star yourself. Yeah. And then I actually got to meet Elvis Presley, and um, I got to meet Barbara Streisand, Shirley Bassey, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, um, 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 uh, the black guy, what was his name? Uh, man, the Rat Pack, the Rat Pack. Um, Ja, 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 ja. And Bob Hope, I met Bob Hope, George Burns. They did a, we did a one-week TV show, a TV um, sitcom that I and I was part of the audience. Uh, I had a jacket that had stripes across it, like a like a leopard or a tiger. <laughs> and and Anne Margaret, Anne Margaret, famous movie star. I don't know if you remember it. Do you remember? No. No. Anne Margaret is a singer. She used to star at the Hilton as well. And she also did movies um, like Doris Day, whom I also met, and Ella Fitzgerald, and, and the Drifters, and the Platters, and the Seekers, and the Shirelles. Um, I met them all. Um, Tom Jones, Frey Mercury Queen, um, I'm trying to think of who played at Caesar's Palace. So, over the two years I worked with him, I was going to the big casinos, booking the show, either the main room with a big star, or 
the lounge, which will be where you would put the drifters or the platters or the seekers. They were no longer so big. They didn't host the main room shows. They'd be in the lounge shows. Gee, if I were to go on, I actually have a list. It's right on the top of that, that, that pile over there. Do you want to get it? Sure. Right on the top. You know why it's there? I pulled out of an old box, trying to get, empty the box out, and I saw all these letters and papers. It's got pen, uh, written in pen. Yeah. And years ago, I decided I should, I should write down all the people that I met in my business in Hollywood as well as in Las Vegas. Steve McQueen uh -huh. from the movie, um, oh, he's done many movies. You know who he is? Steve McQueen. He was a race car, he did race cars. And uh, Mustang Shelby, the Shelby uh, Mustang, have you heard of the Shelby? Yes. He was friendly with Shelby. I was friendly with Frank Sinatra Jr. Frankie Jr. And so he knew I had been a race car driver in South Africa. So he said, you know what, I'm friendly with Steve McQueen and, and um, Shelby, uh, what's his first name? Karen Shelby, what was, I forget his first name now. And, and we were in <coughs> Las Vegas, so we had to travel to the, the sand flats. They're going to test this car on the sand flats, high speed, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, the Mojave Desert, I think it is, outside Vegas, 100 or 200 miles. And so I went with him. And there was Shelby, Carol, Carol Shelby, his name was Carol Shelby, and Steve McQueen, and they were like working in the engine of this Mustang Shelby. Mm -hmm. And so I got to meet him there. Then we had uh, Larry Klein. Larry Klein is still on TV today. I don't know if you've seen him. He does the uh, the news, uh, the ABC, I think it's ABC or CBS, yeah. is on, even now, if you go and look on um, internet now, you'll see his, he interviews the presidents and all that sort of stuff. Okay. Um, he got one of my books eventually. Um, Sally Kellerman, she was a, uh, what was she, uh, James Kahn. She was um, something in a James Caan movie. I met her and her husband. Uh, I hope he's, he's not alive anymore, so he won't sue me. But he was, when I got to their house up in Hollywood Hills, his wife Sally was a movie star and he was a producer, Kellerman. And he was doing cocaine. Everybody in Hollywood did cocaine. Uh, and, and I was offered a hundred times like, uh, no way, Jose, not cocaine. I'll smoke a joint, because God put it on earth, but no. So, then I met Joan Rivers. Oh, you, oh. you saw, and her sister. Yeah. So I had a date with her sister. Now, Joan and her sister owned a nightclub um, on Sunset Boulevard, where, where it kind of splits. They had a nightclub there. And I would go there, hang out there, and then her uh, sister, and I don't even remember her name, <laughs> Rose, I think it was Rose or something. Um, she had the hearts for me, but hey, I was a popular boy, I didn't need her. And she was not that famous in here. <laughs> then Vince Neil, uh, Vince Neil is a rock and roll star, if you've ever heard of Vince Neil. And then Lou Rawls, Lou Rawls, is also a singing star, a black dude, um, very famous. I think he sings the blues, if I remember correctly. Steven Tyler, Steven Tyler, oh, wow. another rock and roller. Um, Iron Maiden, Led Zeppelin, Studio City, I used his studio. Um, the Bad Boys, I don't know if you remember Bad Boys. Yeah. Then Kenny Kiniston, he had a very short lived career. Um, his wife worked for me in my rock and roll, in my office in Hollywood. Um, he ma she married this ugly, ugly, short, stout, ugly, and his voice was not even that good, but he made a hit record. And they were going to Las Vegas in his new Stingray Corvette, yes. and they crashed and he got killed. Oh no. Yeah. Uh-oh. I hear the babies crying.
then Billy Idol, then Anne Margaret, Anne Margaret, Viva Las Vegas. That was Anne Margaret, and she um, starred in the Hilton Hotel. And then Bob Hope, George Burns, um, what's burning? I smell something burning. Uh, Bob Hope and George Burns, and there was another actor in there, I forget who it was. Uh, Dean Martin or Frank Sinatra was in there. It was uh, a, a one week telecast, and it was shot at the Hilton Hotel. So I was invited to be um, sitting in the rows there with this jacket with all the stripes and things on it. And then, oh, and Anne Margaret. And she's a dancer, as you know, a singer and a dancer. So she would come down off the stage dancing through the audience and then she'd grab me and we'd do a spin around dance and then i sit down again. That was my claim to fame. <laughs> um, it was a TV special. Danny Thomas was also at the Hilton. Raquel Welch. Raquel Welch was nice. I picked her up at the airport, as I was asked to do by the entertainment director. She had two kids with her, and I took them to their hotel. And I spent a little bit of time in the in the in her hotel room with the kids. The kids liked me right away. I guess they liked the accent. But I was a dad at that time, anyhow. Then Ralph Nader, he ran for president later in life. He interviewed me. Then Kings of Leon, which is now called Kings of Leon, is currently a band, with Glenn Hughes. I think Glenn Hughes was Fleetwood Mac originally. I know he did a stint with Black Sabbath. Um, but Glenn Hughes and I also became friends. And in fact, when they came to South Africa, about three, four years ago, he came along with Duff from Guns N' Roses, both of whom I know. Um, I was invited to meet them at uh, Jacaranda radio station. So I went to go and sh uh, show him photographs of us <laughs> 20, 30 years ago in Hollywood. Dick Clark. Dick Clark is, um, is very well known in America on TV. Um, what have I got here? Top, oh, uh, top, uh, top 100 hits. He did the top 100 hits weekly on, tele on television, radio, radio. <laughs> and he was the host, Dick Clark. Rosanna Brasi, I don't even know, Italian actor. Oh, Rosano Brasi, famous Italian actor that did a lot of romantic movies. Dwight Yochum. Dwight Joker, I got him an apartment for his nephew in um, in L.A., in Hollywood, in North Hollywood, those days. Dwight Joker was a great country, he still is a great country uh, musician, singer. Those who like movie, um, country music will know exactly who Dwight Joker is. Man, <laughs> I haven't looked at this in... 20 years, 20 years since I even looked at this. It just happened to be in that box at the bottom and I took all the paperwork and I put it on the table over there to file it somewhere. And then I saw this. Uh, Sting, is that Sting? Um, oh, Christina Applegate, Wild Bull, Jeff Bridges movie. Oh, she did a movie with uh, Jeff Bridges called Wild Bull. Bull. Uh, Bill Haley and the Comets. I uh, was friendly with Bill and the Comets, the guys. In fact, brought them to South Africa um, in the 70s or 80s when I was the agent. Albert Hammond. Albert Hammond and I looked alike. I remember in Clifton Beach in Cape Town. He was performing in Cape Town. I had brought him to go, together with a promoter from Johannesburg. I uh, forget his name for the moment. He, he's died. He died since. He made the song, It Never Rains in Southern California. Then I met Lulu. You all remember Lulu? That was in England. Freddie Mercury and the entire band. The Temptations. The Carpenters. 
Uh, the carpenters. Oh, Karen. Oh, Karen. I had the hearts for her. She liked me. She liked me as well. But her manager, uh, Sherwin Bash, his, his name was Sherwin Bash, he was like watching this South African boyki trying to get friendly with Karen Carpenter backstage every night. And he saw that Karen and I were like rapping and I don't even remember the Carpenters, but she was the one of the most harmonic, melodious voices ever, ever. Nobody compared to Karen Carpenter. Doris Day, Doris Day, I also had a little flair there for Doris. I used to go backstage and hang out in in a dressing room with her, and uh, yeah, yeah, whatever. Uh, Robert Goulet, Bob Goulet, Bob Goulet and I did a TV thing together, a TV special. He sings the American Anthem. Whenever you hear the American Anthem on national television, it's Bob Goulet, he has that deep voice, you know. And he also performed at the Flamingo. Yeah, he was the headliner at the Flamingo Casino. Rich Little, and none of you all remember Rich Little, Harry Belafonte, I'm sure you all know, I introduced Harry Belafonte to a South African singer called Leta Mabulu. I'm sure my black brothers and sisters who are listening knows who Leta Mabulu is. Her mother worked in the Baragwanath Hospital where I had done a, like a week of volunteer work at, and I met her mother and she said, you must hear my daughter sing, you're an agent. Hey, she's got a beautiful voice. She's performing this Saturday at the Jabulani Amphitheater. Jabulani, yeah. Jabulani Amphitheater in Johannesburg. I had to get special permission from the police to go into Soweto because it was, whites were not allowed in there. It was apartheid years, ne? So um, I got permission and I went to listen to her. I then introduced her to Harry Belafonte. He brought her to America. She was making like a, a hundred rand a month, those days, you know, 70s, 80s. He gave her $20,000 a week. And she was the opening act for Harry Belafonte, who was the main act at Caesar's Palace. Debbie Reynolds. Oh, how many of you remember Debbie Reynolds? She was a big star at the Hilton Hotel and also a movie star. Met her. Uh, no romance. <laughs> uh, Bob Hope and George Burns. Jonathan Butler, South African singer that I, that I auditioned in Cape Town many years ago. He became pretty well known and got an album or two out. He's a good singer. Um, Danny Williams, another South Africa, South African, I think he was from KwaZulu Natal. He went to England and he got a hit, but died a sudden death, never went anywhere. Billy Daniels, oh, old man Billy Daniels, he sang the Donkey Serenade. For those of you who are 70 years old, you will not know where that was. Uh, let me kill Mister, let me kill Mister. <coughs> motorhead for you younger guys you know motorhead like you know guns and roses you'll know motorhead still popular um and lemmy was my drinking partner in hollywood those days when i was still a sinner so when i was still sex drugs and rock and roll or uh wine woman and song is a nicer way to say it because i never did the drugs and i don't consider smoking a joint drugs it's not a drug god didn't put drugs in the ground man put drugs on the market methamphetamines and cocaine and and all the junk that people are doing but god put a herb on the earth so i do want people to know that marijuana is one of the, over a hundred prescriptions now that i'm a doctor over 100 prescriptions were made from marijuana until 1936 when the medical industry was doing very poorly 
and the drug cartels, Eli Lilly, Pfizer, Merck, Adcock, Ingram, Procter & Gamble, and all the rest of them, Bayer, Bayer and all the rest of them, complained to the government. People are now, they know that their prescription drugs are made from marijuana, so they're growing their own. It was legal to grow. It was a legal substance until 1936. And so they didn't need the doctors. They were doing their marijuana tea. Different strains of marijuana was used for different th ailments. And it would is the number one herb in the world. It's got more protein, fiber, and fuel than any of the two million annuals on earth. It's got B3, B6, B9. Nobody else, nothing else has. Flaxseed has got B3 and B6, or B6 and B9. Most of them had three or six or six and nine, but all three of them. Anyhow, so let me kill my stuff from Odeb, and I were drinking partners. He was on one of my, one, yeah, just one of my TV shows, uh, uh, which was to come. I'll tell you about that. But I'm giving you the celebrities I've met over the years. Uh, I probably have a story for each one, which means it's not bull twang. If you come to my house, and many people have heard me say, you met so and so, you are, come on, come on, come on. What are you doing in South Africa? Well, I'm South African born, dude. I'm an American citizen. My wife is American. My children are American, born in America. But I am born here. So there's many reasons why I'm here. God sent me here. And we'll get to that later. Um, oh, C.C. DeVault, that was a group called Poison. Also, one time, Wonder Band and then died out. James Hatfield, there's the black dude. I don't remember what he was or who he was. James Hatfield. Uh, Ra Raquel Welsh. Um, Little Anthony and the Imperials. Oh, yeah. Now, I like Little Anthony and the Imperials. Man, that dude had a voice. In fact, one night I was watching Little Anthony and the Imperials at the Sahara Hotel. He was performing in the lounge shop. And guess who was sitting in the back row, right by the door? Little Anthony wore a belt, beautiful belt. He said, this was given to me by the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley. And he said, I thank you, Elvis. I turned around. There is Elvis Presley. This is before I even met him. It's like, wow! Wow, I grew up. Elvis Presley was like the man in South Africa, you know, like the Beatles were or anybody else, but Elvis was the man. Um, so I met him uh, with little Anthony and the Imperials. He had a wonderful voice. Uh, Sonny Bono, Sonny and Sher, you know who Sher is. Well, Sonny was my husband, Sonny and Bono, so I met both of them at the Sahara. Um, then the bad boys, I said that early on. Uh, Corey Feldman, he's currently on a lot of, lot of movies. He was um, seven... No, he was 15 when I met him. His father was Bob Feldman, and we were buddies in Hollywood. And Corey was a child uh, actor. He'd been in a few movies, and he was doing one at the time that I met him. And my son was 15 years old, so they became buddies. And thank goodness the guy lasted. I saw him the other night on uh, who wants to be a millionaire or deal or no deal or one of those shows he was on. So he's still going strong. Um, and then we got, uh, uh, oh, uh, David Hustle, Hustleblatt. Uh, we, what did we do together in Cape Town? Oh, we were judges in um, a Halloween biz, a Halloween contest or, I can't remember, but I know he had like, eight double whiskies that night. And he ordered, when they said they're closing the bar, he said one for him, me, double, and one for him, I didn't drink whiskey. So he had that double and my double. I think we left at four o'clock in the morning. He was staying at the 
Jerengracht Hotel in, um, in Cape Town. Uh, who else? Arnold Schwarzenegger. Arnold. One night with George, George, what's his surname? George, um, George, uh, the famous actor. Eh, I'll come to Noir. They were in a restaurant that a friend of mine was the concierge. So he said, dude, you must come down. Arnold Schwarzenegger and George are having dinner with two chicks. So I went down there, of course, and sat at the table next to him. Then I heard Arnold saying that when he gets home from a shoot every night after he's shooting a movie in data, when he gets home, he would love to sit in his sauna and um, drink a glass of red wine. That was his favorite thing to do after a shoot, relax. And I heard that, and I know a lot about water purified water and I know about skin absorption so I said to Mr. Schwarzenegger do you know while you are sitting in your sauna you are absorbing chlorine into your bloodstream killing millions of blood cells every time you're sitting there the skin is absorbing and it has no saturation point it will just continue absorbing the chlorine out of the water what you need to do is get a, a jacuzzi that has no chlorine in it. Use ozone, use silver, silver particles, granulated, activated carbon, and make your swimming pool, a your jacuzzi, a health. You lay in there and you oxygenate. You come out there feeling revived. But when you've been in that jacuzzi for an hour, you probably feel like, okay, it's time now to wrap it up and go to bed because you've got to be up at six in the morning for a, another shoot. And he agreed with me. So he asked me my name and we chatted and he invited me to come to his house and install a water system. And I had contact with various water <coughs> factories in Illinois that sold the various equipment. So we went to his house and installed, so I met him and chatted to him. Uh, he loved what I had to say about, you know, you know what I talk about normally, medicine, health, diseases, how to cure the causes of diseases and the cures. So that's how I knew Arnold Schwarzenegger, who then became governor of, of California afterwards. Where was I? Uh, oh, there. George, oh, George Clooney. George Clooney. George Clooney and Arnold were having dinner that night, so I met George as well. Um, Johnny Depp, Johnny Depp, again, um, in a restaurant, a Mexican restaurant I used to go to on Thursday nights in Hollywood. The best Mexican restaurant there is. It, it's, uh, and it's right across the road from Universal Studio where Johnny Depp was doing a movie or whatever he was doing at Universal Studio and him and the producers would come over to the restaurant <clears throat> and have dinner there. They had that great food, I must say. Uh, uh, Roberta's or Samantha's or whatever it was called. But it was on Melrose Avenue, Melrose Avenue in Los Angeles, just opposite Universal Studio. So I went there every Thursday night and I would always say hi and, and I just never got over to go and sit down and, and didn't feel it was necessary. I was at the time now hosting a TV show. I was hosting MTV, musical television. I was producing and hosting a rock and roll show. And that's how I met all the rock and rollers, the more modern day Lemmy Kilmister, Ronnie James Dio, Black Sabbath, um, uh, I met them all, Ozzy Osbourne and his wife, uh, I met all those people there, there's still probably a whole lot more that I met when I was hosting the show, it was a weekly Let's Rock and Roll with Basil Gold, and it was a half hour TV show, so I would feature 
uh, celebrities and also unsigned bands. Bands that were great, but had not made it. They didn't get a record deal. So my job was to find, go to the Roxy, uh, Roxy Theatre, then to the um, uh, Whiskey A Go-Go, and then down to, um, um, I forget the name of the club now, to the various clubs every night, seven nights a week in Hollywood. I would go to clubs and listen to bands, heavy metal, most of them, and B.B. Uh, King was one of them. He was great. B.B. Uh, well, B.B. King, um, not the B.B. King, and that was that. Uh, I'm sure his name is on you for sure, because B.B. King and I were very good friends. He would come to Las Vegas for three weeks every year, and I met his mom. Uh, well, I spoke to her in Chicago. Um, Kafius was his bus driver because uh, he always traveled in a bus. He didn't like flying and that sort of stuff. And I would go into his dressing room. He didn't drink, but the band all drank in, in the adjoining dressing room, the green room. He had his own green room. I would go in there and sit and chat with him. He was a beautiful person. Out of all the musical artists I ever met, B.B. King was the man with the heart. Uh, I, I loved him. That's why he sang soul, man, and the blues. I mean, he was a man with a good heart. Uh, all right, so Tarzan. Oh, Tarzan, I forget his name, but he was Tarzan in a movie. I remember we were at a party, uh, one of the Beverly Hills parties were up in the hills, uh, Hollywood Hills or Beverly Hills, uh, always parties, always parties. Madonna's house should have parties on Friday nights. So I met him at one of the parties. We chatted and chatted and I said, you're in the business, right? So he said, yes. I said, um, what movies have you been in? He said, I, I've been Tarzan on the movies. I said, oh, that's where I know. That's where I know your face from. And we talked about his love affair, and he actually cried. He cried to me. He, he, he let his heart out to the South African boyki, you know, and it was, it was really nice, heartfelt. Vince Neil, Vince Neil, Motley Crue, do you remember Motley Crue? That was Vince Neil. Also knew him relatively well. Gee, man, sissy. Sissy Spacek, I took her home from airport. Oh, she's just a movie star, I don't remember her well. Jose Feliciana brought him to South Africa. Uh, he crashed. But I tell you, that guy had a great voice and he could play that guitar. Uh, I think he played on his lap. He was blind, if I remember correctly. The Scorpions. I uh, forget, that was C.C. Deville, I think. Uh, Louis Prima, Louis Prima. Um, that was a friend of, uh, I was in Las Vegas, I was living with the entertainment director, the musical director for the Hilton, with Elvis Presley and Barbara Streisand and Frank Sinatra. He was the musical director and he was an agent, and that's how I became an agent. And I lived in his house. He had a great big house and I had the room right next to the swimming pool. And no, we're not gay. <laughs> he, he loved the amount of chicks that I had. He'd ask me to bring the chicks over to the swimming pool and skinny dip and that sort of stuff. And yeah, he was very friendly with Louis Prima and Louis Prima's band and his band like worked together. Liberace. Oh, Liberace, what a guy. <laughs> As gay as they come, baby. <laughs> um, I met him and his manager. His manager was a nice dude, actually. And um, so I met them at the Hilton. Danny Thomas. Danny Thomas, also a singer, performer. And he started a, a, a big religious cult sort of thing. I can't remember where it was. Johnny Tillotson. I don't think many of you remember Johnny Tillotson. He had one or two hits. And Margaret, I said that already. Um, and then Ronnie James Dio. Ronnie James Dio did Black Sabbath. 
He did his own albums called Dio. He died um, a few years ago. I was invited to the funeral, but it was in Hollywood and I was here. So uh, Ronnie is on one of my TV shows. I still have photographs in my album. Oh, and as I said, um, many of you out there who are actually listening say, ah, oh, this guy's full of bull. He, can, he met all these famous people, ah, uh, bull. Well, you want to come to my house and challenge me? Put down a thousand rand. And I tell you what, I'll put down ten thousand. It's a bet. I've got albums this big of photographs of me and the stars the people I've worked with and met, okay? And many have seen it, no, many of you have, who have come over and we chat and wow, and they look on the wall, all my pictures of all the celebrities and that, wow, you met them, well, I did a photograph of me and them, I guess I did meet them. A photograph doesn't tell lies. Um, Glenn Hughes, uh, Kings of Leon, uh, Jimmy Page, oh, Jimmy Page was in so many bands, you all know who Jimmy Page was, a great musician. Little Richard. Oh, we were good friends for 30 years. Little Richard, what a nice man. He was gay, and well, I won't say unfortunately, but he was gay. But we were just friends. I would go, and he never had a house. He lived in a hotel. He had the top, the suite in Sunset Boulevard. At the top of the hotel, he had the top floor. He's sweet, and that's where he lived. A rich man like him. And I used to visit him there because I used to go to the club downstairs, which was um, 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 the, the, the whiskey a go -go. Samantha Cook. Samantha Cook. I don't even remember who she was. Sam. Apparently, I called her Sam. Natalie Cole. That's Nat King Cole's daughter. Um, yes, I, I actually put her on my show once. Frankie Avalon, you do remember him? Uh, he was very good with Jerry Lewis. Uh, they were buddies, I remember. And he'd done one or two movies. He's a singer, love songs. Um, uh, Jerry Lewis, Rod Stewart, I uh, had dinner with him in South Africa. Uh, soccer, soccer, soccer and dinner. We had soccer and dinner. I don't know what I mean. We played soccer or whatever. Uh, Billy Drago. Oh, he's um, Billy Drago is a movie star that you'll see in these um, gangster movies. He wears that white suit with the black tie, bow tie. He's got kind of sleeky eyes and he's kind of sly and he's normally like the mafia boss or something. He's been in quite a few movies, him and his wife, Sylvia, if I remember correctly. They both had been in a few movies. And then uh, Gary Busey, Gary Busey, you all know him, is a movie star. Met him many times in, um, in the club, the Raffles, the club was called Raffles. Steve Perry, Kenny Loggins, uh, Matt Monroe, Matt Monroe, you remember Matt Monroe, I'm sure. Letton Bulu. Don Dockin, if you remember Don, uh, Albert Hammond, I already spoke about him, I was his look-alike. Uh, people used to come up to me on the beach when we all went to the beach after he, he stayed in Cape Town at the hotel there and we'd go to the beach and they'd tell me perform in the evenings and people wouldn't know the difference. Can I have your autograph? Can I have your autograph? And I said, I, I, I'm not Albert, Albert is over there. <laughs> Steve Tyler, Jack Russell, Jack Jones, Jack Jones and I, uh, Jack Jones, famous uh, star of the time. We, uh, we were judges in a beauty contest. Uh, so we flew to New Jersey to do the Miss USA beauty contest. So I was a judge and he was one of the judges as well. Vera Johns, that's um, Miss World, Miss Universe, from Rhodesia. I won't tell you the story about that, it's too close to home. Barbara Barnard, I won't tell you the story about Barbara, but Chris Barnard uh, became a friend of mine in the medical industry. 
in Los Angeles. I was invited to his funeral and Barbara was his wife. But I dated her before he did. Um, Eddie Eckstein, a South African old timer. Saul Kersner, well, we went to synagogue together. He owned Sun City, all the Sun Hotels, Saul Kersner. We grew up as small boys in the same Oxford uh, synagogue in Johannesburg. Jonathan Butler, John Burks was the radio, big. Um, was Radio 702 or something, LM Radio, John Burks. Quincy Jones, I knew Quincy very well, invited him on one of my TV shows. He sent me a letter, which I do have here, and um, he couldn't do it because he, um, he was busy. And the Righteous Brothers. Gee, don't tell me this anymore. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I haven't even mentioned these. Well, wow. oh, of course, Michael Jackson. I haven't mentioned the Jacksons, Sylvester Stallone. Oh, no, wait, wait, there's still more. Lisa Monet, The Cosbys. You remember the the movie, The Cosby, the TV series, The Cosbys. Lisa Monet. I remember I went to have my hair done, and she was having her hair done by this uh, black lady. She's also uh, well, a beautiful black chick. Um, she was having her hair done by this girl who specialised in black hair and braiding it and making patterns and all that with her fingers. I don't know how they do it. With this little hair, they, how they do it, I have no idea how they do that. Patterns with short little hair. And, and she took three hours on Lisa, so we chatted. Don Henley. Uh, all of the Jacksons, I mean all of the Jacksons, mother and father, and and Jermaine and Tito, I had them on my Beverly Hills, I used to have, Monday nights was Beverly Hills, on Monday night was Celebrity Night, the red carpet out on the pavement, and limousines, celebrities only, or you've got to be somebody to get into that restaurant, called Cyros, C-I-R-O-S in Beverly Hills, very expensive. And I was the host and we'd have a piano and a player and then I would look in the audience, I would see uh, Frank Stallone, Frank Stallone, Sylvester Stallone's brother, Mrs. Stallone and her husband whom I knew from Las Vegas, Mafia boy. <laughs> and he married um, um, Sylvester's mom, Jackie. We called her the Crystal Lady. She gave me a nice gold necklace with a crystal, a crystal hanging on it. She must wear that for life and bring you good luck. I don't know what happened to it. You know, I mean, necklaces have I lost. What? Um, I met all of the Stallones, uh, except Sylvester. I met his mom. I met um, Frankie. His brother was a singer. And I had him sing on my show, uh, but I never met him. But the mom, the Drifters, the Platters, the Shirelles, the Pointer Sisters, Bill Ailey and the Comets, Tom Jones. Um, I was on a, on a tour with him for a week here in Sarka. Joe Dolan, Joe Dolan, who's going to tell Maria he won't be home. You remember that song? Hush, hush, Maria, hush, hush. A beautiful song. Joe Dolan, he had many hits, 12 gold records. I, I was his agent for Las Vegas. I met him in South Africa and his brother. I got a lot of pictures with him and me. We had a lot of good times. But man, again, this dude could drink. We went out after one of his concerts in Cape Town. We went to this restaurant in 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 a uh, sea point uh, a friend of mine actually owned it right next to the movie house he had excuse me he had like 16 irish coffees till three four o'clock in the morning he got so messed up 
I had to take him home every night. Princess Margaret, Princess Margaret, I met her in a nightclub in England. And when I went up and spoke to her, I don't recall what I said to her, but I do remember what she said to me. Don't forget who you're speaking to. <laughs> Princess Margaret. Frank Sinatra, Nancy I met, uh, Nancy Sinatra performed at Sarah, Frank Sinatra Jr. brought him to South Africa, so I know him very well. As I say, he and I went out to the desert and met Steve McQueen and Carol, Carol Shelby, Elvis, Elvis Presley and Colonel Parker, B.B. King, I knew I'd get to him, Shirley Bassey, I played tennis with her. Uh, at the at the hotel, so they needed a fourth in the team, and I'm a good tennis player, always have been. That's why my knees are so messed up now. Uh, Engelbert Humperdinck um, and his daughter worked for me in my Hollywood office at a time. Um, Patty Page, oh Patty Page, how much is that dog in the window? <laughs> I do hope that dog is for sale. <laughs> yeah, um, where's the romance? Sammy Davis Jr. is the other guy that I want, uh, I said the black guy that I couldn't remember. Uh, the Rat Pack. Sammy Davis Jr., Bob Hope, George Burns, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin. And I, it was a one week t uh, telecast in Las Vegas. So I was in the audience every night. So I got to meet them and s listen to them. You know, yeah, it took a week to shoot a one-hour show. Sure. Uh, Bob Hope would forget his lines. He'd just forget his lines each time. Yeah. And we'd all crack up laughing, the audience would laugh, but all that is taken out. So you don't get to see the fun of making this show. Um, Juliet Prowse. Juliet Prowse is a South African who married Elvis Presley. And I met her as well. She's a South African, of course. What have I got here? Sir William. W Serena Williams. Oh, I can't remember. Figure out what I wrote here. Star, star, I don't know. Uh, Guns and Roses, of course. Guns and Roses were just roses when I met them. I met Slash. His father, Peter Hunt. I don't know because that's his name. Peter and I were smoking buddies. And, um, and of course, stuff also. <laughs> and they needed some money to print flyers, like this 8x10 flyers, to hand out on Sunset Boulevard that they would be playing on the 21st or whatever the date would be on Saturday night at midnight. So they wanted a lot of audience to hand out flyers, like all the bands do. On, on Saturday nights there, everybody's handing out flies. All the bands that are planning on playing there would hand out flies. At the end, at two o'clock in the morning when the club closes, you walk down Sunset Boulevard. It's like, you know, people look at it, they throw it down there. The pavements are like, and the street is just covered in flies. Eh? <laughs> Next morning it's all clear. The garbage people come along and take it all. And yes, I gave, um, I gave money for them to print these flyers. Then I invited a friend of mine, uh, Bernstein, uh, Goldstein, Goldstein, to come hear them at, um, at the Roxy. Mm -hmm. He liked them. He introduced them to um, David Geffen, Geffen Records. Have you heard of De Geffen Records? Mm -hmm. He introduced them to Geffen Records signed a deal for them, a week later they all had Stingray Corvettes. <laughs> From yes. nothing, they were like, one was working in a car wash, one was doing this, you know, remedial jobs to be able to pay their rent, which mm -hmm. very few of the bands in Hollywood ever paid their rent, they get evicted, yeah, they save up some bucks, they go into that building, and to get evicted it takes three months to get them out, so they save the money for three months, and move to the next building, and That's yeah. Juliet Pras, yeah, she was um, married to Elvis. 
Guns N' Roses, yeah, Duff, uh, Duff and I became better friends. He was on one of my TV shows. Jamie, Jamie Lane, that was a group called Warrant. Warrant, very popular in, in America at the time. Glenn Campbell, Barbara Streisand, Nick Nolte, I told you that uh, Nick and I, I took him home when he was so drunk one night. It took us three hours to get to Malibu because the roads, the mountain, uh, Malibu Mountains, the houses, movie stars' houses on Malibu Mountain facing the Pacific Coast the highway. The whole mountain slid down, it rained like mad, cats and dogs. Yeah. And the whole, whoops, sorry, the whole mountain came down, the houses came down, the freeway was blocked. And it's like one o'clock in the morning at a bar in, um, on Wilshire Boulevard, which is West Hollywood, West Hollywood, uh, verging onto Beverly Hills. So um, I had a lim my own limousine, so I decided to take him home. But my driver said he had to get home, he had to do something in the morning. So I said, no, okay. Um, you get a cab, go home, I'll drive the limo. Mm -hmm. And so did Nick Nolte sit in the back? No, he sat in the front with me, but then he was so drunk he eventually, he went to the back and went and like lay down on the, on the, <laughs> on the, the back of the limo. And we get to um, getting home along Pacific Coast Highway and the cops and the lights and everything, sorry, can't get through. And I said, I've got Nick Nolte in the back. Everyone knows who Nick Nolte is. And he only lives like three blocks down. He says, well, the road is down here. You can't get any further. And it's raining. You're pissing down with rain. So, you know, I'm going to have a drunken Nick Nolte walk home in the rain. So my alternative was go back to the 5, the 405, as we mentioned early on. That freeway go up the 405 over into the valley and along the 101 all the way and then cut off to Malibu Mountains and then come down all the way through the Mount Malibu Mountains down to where we were two blocks away, three blocks away. Uh -huh. Took us like we got home at three o'clock in the morning, I got him home. So that's the story of my career basically. I joined MTV, um, then, you know, when I was in LA, living in Hollywood, so I became a producer, I produced uh, all the music shows with all the bands and the celebrities, um, I did uh, 160 TV shows of that, with various celebrities and various bands, and then I found the Lord. Amen. Then, amen. Then I found the Lord Jesus Christ, and the message that came to me was obedience, my son, righteous living, which you'll see on one of my videos that is on Facebook or on YouTube, righteous living, where my life changed. And God said, you know, as popular as I was on TV in America, with all the youth, you know, MTV, everybody watches MTV all day long, and and my show was a very popular one because I would host celebrities, you know, on the show. They wouldn't be performing, they'd just be co-hosts, you know, with me, questions and chatting and that sort of stuff. And to do a new TV show, which became Awareness. And that came from my book. My book was called Awareness, my first book. So that was turned into a TV series, and I did 36 TV shows, that's um, 39, sorry, three series. A series uh, on television once a week is 13 weeks. So I did 13, then I did another 13, and then ABC encouraged me and they, they put me on ABC. I did another 13, and then I decided to come to South Africa. And I gave up that career to come here and to try and heal the people out here, brothers and sisters, those of you, HIV, cancer, diabetes, 
all with this big stomach, you know. Millipop, 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 cow smoke, sugar, and microwave ovens, boiling your food and tap water, all these things. You earned your diseases. Oh, maybe you don't know, they don't teach us at school about the contaminants and the toxins in water. Or at Millipop has got no nutrition. Or that boiling your fruit, boiling your vegetables. You know if you boil water, you are supposed to boil water if you don't trust it, if there's something in the water, bacteria in it. If you boil, you will kill. So what do you think when you kill? You kill anything that's living in the pot. So you put your carrots in your rice, your, your cabbage, your cauliflower, your broccoli, you put it in a pot and you boil. You kill it when you exceed 88 degrees, 88. Boiling is 100 degrees. Now you are going to boiling point. When you exceed 88 degrees, you destroy all the nutrients in that food. So you looks like you've got a healthy plate of food. You've got all the colors. You've got the, the, the orange color, the pumpkin or the carrots. You've got the green beans for the greens. You've got the white for the potato or the rice. You've got the chicken. Yeah. Whatever you got. And then you've got the beetroot for the red. You've got a oh, nice plate of food. But everything was boiled. Or oh, microwave junk. Hey, where not? Okay, in the Ambergasle, everybody. Ushalagasle. It was nice chatting. Did you you now know my life story? Yes, thank you so much for your time. It was great. <laughs> well, I don't think I've ever, ever done that for any time. I doubt that anybody watched. I doubt it. If you watched me, um, I'm trying to s slow down on Facebook and... and, and uh, and all the, no look, there's already 10 notifications in the last hour. It's going to go to 20 and then it goes to 40 and as soon as I've done 20, <laughs> answer, you know, look through and give an answer here and there, there. And then I see there's another 20. Anyhow, but I'd like to know if any of you listen to, to my story, my life, because you're not ever going to hear it again. And I'm going to die soon, eh? I'm getting old now, man. I'm 80. I want to go. I want to go home. I want to go home. Oh, I want to go home. Oh, how I want to go home. Just put your hand in the hand of the man who stills the waters. Put your hand in the hand of the man who calms the sea. Take a look at yourself and you can look at others differently. Just put your hand in the hand of the man from Galilee. Every time I look into the holy book I tremble. When I read about the part of the holy assemble. That's good night. It's time to go to bed. It's getting late.